Thank you, Seth. Now, please join us in welcoming our moderator and author of Secret City, James Kerchick, and panelists to the stage for our closing plenary, From Fire to Empowered, the history and progress of LGBTQ presidential appointees. Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks. Well, come on. Those who engage in acts of homosexuality and other perverted sex activities are unsuitable for employment in the federal government. So read a 1950 report of the United States Senate entitled Employment of Homosexuals and Other Sex Perverts in Government. According to this report, the homosexual lacked the moral fiber and emotional stability of normal persons. The tendency of the homosexual to gather other perverts around him and to entice normal individuals to engage in perverted practices made him unfit to serve his country. Persons who indulge in such degraded activity are committing not only illegal and immoral acts, but they are also constituting security risks in positions of public trust. The purge of gay men and women from the federal government known as the Lavender Scare, ruined countless lives, many of which I recount in my book, Secret City, The Hidden History of Gay Washington. That story begins with the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when America's entry into World War II dramatically transformed the popular conception of homosexuality from a mere sin, crime, and a medical condition into a national security threat. In one chilling case that I uncovered from the 1950s, a self-described hatchet man in the State Department's Internal Security Bureau fired a gay employee who then promptly stood up from his chair, exited the building, and shot himself in the head outside the State Department. For most of the 20th century, the gravest political sin in Washington was to be gay worse even than being a communist at the height of the Cold War. A communist, after all, could become an ex-communist. But there was no redemption for those accused of what the Senate Majority Leader in 1942 described as the crime too loathsome to mention. As you might imagine, many of the stories that I uncovered while researching Secret City shocked and depressed me. But many others inspired me. There were the gay spies who served in the Office of Strategic Services, the predecessor to the CIA during World War II. There were the founding members of the Mattachine Society, who in 1965, four years before Stonewall, peacefully picketed outside the White House for gay equal rights. There was the creative resistance of two gay men whom I interviewed, one of whom worked for the federal government in the 1960s and the other during the Reagan administration in the 1980s who told me how they and their gay friends and other departments of the federal government would adopt female nicknames for each other while talking over the phone so as to elude their eavesdropping coworkers. Fortunately, such secretive tactics are no longer necessary for gay public servants working in our nation's capital, which is no longer the repressive place that it once was. The story of how the secret city evolved into an open city is the story of a country overcoming one of its deepest fears. The collective realization by millions of people that their sexual orientation was something about which they not need feel ashamed constituted more than a series of individual acts of personal liberation through their willingness to challenge the dogmas of the medical, religious, and political establishments these people helped liberate America, moving our country out from under a dark shadow of fear and ignorance. Indeed, across the broad sweep of American history, no group has witnessed a more rapid transformation in its social and legal status than LGBT people. This is a magnificent accomplishment of the liberal society, enabled by the fundamentally American concepts of free expression, pluralism, and open inquiry. Having spent the last decade researching and writing a book about gay people in the federal government, I am enormously honored and humbled 
to be here with all of you. Out LGBT public officials who are not only serving your country, but by doing so are honoring the sacrifices and the courage of the gay men and women who came before us. And I'm delighted to be joined here on the stage today with a very impressive group of public policy professionals who have ascended to the top of the very institutions that not long ago would have considered them public enemy number one. Uh, beginning on my far right, which is no, uh, there's no double entendre there, uh, is uh, Rafi Friedman Gerspan, who is the Deputy Director of Public Engagement at the United States Department of Transportation. Yes. Um, uh, Ned Price is the spokesperson for the U.S. Department of State, which is, when you think about it, what I just told you about the history of that institution is an incredible uh, fact. So, Ned, thank you for being here. Uh, uh, Emily Ruiz is the assistant to the president and White House director of political strategy and outreach. And... Amanda Simpson, who just spoke, uh, is responsible for uh, coordinating external research activities for Airbus in the United States and has a very distinguished career in government before that, which we just heard. So, Amanda, thank you. Um, I'm going to shift now to my seat. Let's start. Oh, wow. Sorry about that. Uh, let's start with Rafi. And I'm going to ask a question for all of you, but we'll start with you. Why is it important to have openly LGBT people in our federal government? Well, we are members of society, number one. We exist, we are here. We are literally in our country from the Aleutian Islands to the Keys to the Virgin Islands. And um, it is important, especially in this moment, when more and more people are coming out, especially our young people, that they see a government that is reflective of who they are, that people understand the intricate issues that our community faces. And it's not just about making sure that we have civil rights, of course it is, but it's also about our lived experience, our lived equality, and our lived social um, experience. And that's what the government is dedicated to. It's about the governance of our nation. And, uh, you know, everyone in here understands uh, constitutional uh, structure of this country, but, you know, for those of us who are coming from smaller places, it is important just on a basic factual um, existence that we all see ourselves uh, through the decisions that are made on our behalf and that per your history that you just um, eloquently spoke about, that we are not shamed into um, uh, you know, a closet, that we are um, part of the decision-making and body politic of this country. So that is why it is so important that we have out uh, uh, representation in government, be it elected, be it appointed, be it career people as well who serve um, our country every day. Ed, we'll go across the room, yes, of course. First, um, it's a pleasure to be here, humbled to be here. Thank you to, to Victory Fund, to, to you, Jamie, um, for your incredible uh, chronicle of this city and this country. Uh, it, was, uh, it was your book that taught me about the, the seedy gay underbelly of the Iran-Contra scandal, um, so I very much uh, appreciate that. Um, I absolutely uh, embrace everything we just heard from, from Rafi. It's important that we have uh, a workforce, a government workforce, public service and public servants that not only look like the country they serve, but also represent uh, the country they serve. And I think uh, it's better to say represent than look like because of course uh, there are traits that are visible, um, but there are also traits that are invisible. Uh, and when you talk about a public uh, service community that represents uh, the country uh, that we're serving. I think that's what we all aspire to. Speaking of someone who's at the State Department, uh, I think there's um, something else that, that comes to mind. We, we often travel around the world. We're, we're on the road probably two weeks out of the month. Uh, and oftentimes we're speaking with friendly interlocutors. Oftentimes we're speaking with countries with whom we have a great deal of disagreements and divergences. And it is especially meaningful uh, to be at that table when we are raising the issue of human rights broadly uh, and LGBTQ rights specifically in countries around the world. There are uh, a number of countries uh, that 
offer these arguments. And you, no, 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 you don't understand. Uh, we're at a certain stage in our development. You can't impose your, your Western values on us. They're typically sheepish uh, when they make that argument to the Secretary of State, but they're especially sheepish uh, when they make that argument when I'm sitting right across from them. Uh, and I, I vividly recall uh, one of the first briefings I gave at the, at the State Department. Um, and at the start of each briefing, we sort of offer messages uh, that we want to make sure uh, get into the bloodstream. And one of the first messages I offered was uh, expressing deep concern uh, over the plight of two gay uh, Russian uh, siblings who were tortured uh, and who faced a, a return to Chechnya uh, where they would almost face uh, certain uh, further torture. Uh, and the response that I got, me delivering that, who I was, my identity, uh, to the rest of the world, it, it was, for the first time, it, it struck me what, what it means uh, to have that power of representation. Uh, representation here, but also uh, representation to the rest of the world, which I think is, is vitally important. I want to echo uh, what Ned said and Rafi. I want to start by thanking uh, the Victory Fund for this invitation and for having um, so much to celebrate, thanks to, in large part, your work as an organization, but many of you in this room. You know, I think it's really important also to talk about the multiple identities that we have, right? So to echo everything they said, but add on. You know, the Biden-Harris administration is the most diverse administration in history, and those things do not happen by accident. <laughs> across the White House, across the agencies, the president and the vice president have made it a tremendous priority to make sure that we're reflected. I mean, you see that with, for example, Secretary Pete. You see that with Vice President Harris. And so that's just as important. I think to echo what they've said but add on, I think for many of us, we're in different paths uh, around our career, our personal lives. And so, for example, for myself, being somebody who's married to a woman, somebody who has young kids, somebody who works in the political space, it's really important that we're reflected, that we're at the table, but that we are also joining all of our allies and advocating um, for our outspokenness on so many of the issues that we have seen, of course, foreign, but unfortunately domestic over the last two years. And so, you know, we've come a long way. I know that we're on the precipice of signing the Right to Marriage Act, and I know that there are a lot of things to celebrate, but because of all of the work that remains unfinished, it is just as important uh, for us to be at the table, but for us to also make room for others who are still gonna join the team. Again, I end up last. I'm not really sure how that happened. Uh, last but not least. Well, I, as one who's not in the administration, I'd like to point out that the U.S. government is also an employer. And so when any organization says that we will not hire, we will not consider, we will not promote people of any group, then they are limiting their ability to not only attract those people, but to potentially reach out to exceptional people in different categories. That, that could be the person who takes that organization to new heights, to bring new policies, new practices, and particularly in the government, to move an organization, a department forward in a way that will benefit all of the country. And when you don't do that, you're actually hurting the United States of America. So that's a, just a key important point on why LGBT people, LGBTQ plus people, should be included in not just the government, but in all, in all parts of, uh, of, of industry as well. Thanks. Could you maybe talk about your own professional journey and when was the moment when you had to decide to be out? And was it a difficult decision? not only personally, but professionally? What were the pros and cons that you had to weigh? Anything that you could impart on that? Yeah, well, I, um, I came out twice in the sense of um, when I was 12 years old, I realized I was attracted to boys. Um, 
people aren't surprised here, I was born or signed uh, male at birth, but um, my, as my siblings used to say, uh, girl we knew. Um, and, uh, you know, it was 1999. Um, however, you know, for my generation, um, <clears throat> there just were no um, very many visibly, you know, trans youth that were out there. Um, and it wasn't until college that I um, transitioned. But it's interesting in terms of the perspective of you know, thinking about a post-college life, because I transitioned and then I realized, oh my gosh, only a handful of states actually have employment protections for people like me. Um, and uh, certainly my home state of Massachusetts was one of the early states that had protections on the basis of sexual orientation. Uh, but as people from the Bay State know, we had a uh, large fight to get gender identity protections um, uh, in the state civil rights code, including in employment. And in fact, that's how I sort of started my journey, um, being the daughter of two social workers and the great granddaughter of a suffragist, I decided, what do I need to do in order to make sure that not only myself, but my community is afforded the protections of uh, the state when it comes to employment and a million other uh, different um, parts of the law that we want to make sure people can live their lives. Um, I joined the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition um, and joined the fight for um, uh, protecting trans folks at the state uh, level. Um, that's what jettisoned my career into government. I was a political science major. I thought I actually would do international work, um, but it was this sense of, frankly, if I'm not protected um, in, on the domestic side, uh, how can I even, you know, go out and do work on behalf of my country? Um, so uh, certainly it was uh, a great experience of learning really the grassroots organizing and, you know, we were successful and I think everyone knows the rest of the history, but it was this sense of participating in my government being there with other LGBTQ folks, and in particular making sure that trans and non-binary and under, uh, other gender fluid uh, individuals could be a part of the decision making for our country. Thank you. And I, I forgot to mention in Ned's introduction, he worked for the, the CIA. So maybe you can talk about what was it like being a gay man in the CIA? Sure, um, you know, when, when I think about my identity and in my own uh, journey, there are really three episodes that, that come to mind. Uh, and the first was by far the most painful. Uh, as, as Jamie mentioned, uh, I did join the CIA uh, out, of, out of college. Uh, it, uh, for a while, I thought uh, my prospects were in jeopardy. Uh, and this goes back to that first episode. I had just concluded my second day of a polygraph exam, two full days of being tied up to a a lie detector and being asked about everything you have done in your life. Um, it was uh, arduous enough to have to come back for a second day. And then the real kicker is at the end of the exam, when you have completed everything else, they ask you the hardest question. They ask you, what haven't you told us that you think we should know? And I was not out at the time. I was deeply uncomfortable with my own identity. Uh, but in my mind, I thought, well, that's they know. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they're asking. That's what they're after. If I don't tell them, I'm not going to get this job. Uh, so I said, well, uh, I, I think I may be gay. Uh, and to his credit, <laughs> um, he said, don't want to hear any more about that. Um, not really sure what he meant by that, but um, uh, I was happy to move on, as, uh, as was he. Um, <laughs> The, the next episode, uh, it, was, it was at the CIA, and this was uh, a few years later, uh, and I was beginning the journey of coming out. And um, the CIA culture, it's somewhat of a bifurcated culture. Uh, it's a place where you have uh, a set of uh, an operational cadre, and uh, they tend to be more politically conservative, um, uh, many have uh, military backgrounds. This was before Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. And then you have the analytic uh, division. And that, and this is, you know, wild, uh, 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 w printing with a very broad brush, but uh, tend to be more progressive. Um, and I was sort of floating in between those two crowds. Um, as I was considering, you know, whether this is something I should do for my colleagues, uh, what I think influenced me more than anything was seeing senior managers at the CIA 
uh, people who were married to opposite sex partners wearing the lanyard of the LGBTQI plus affinity group. Uh, there's one thing that unites everyone who works at the CIA, uh, whether you're an analyst, whether you're an operations officer, you wear a lanyard uh, because you have to wear your badge on you when you're at the office. Uh, and to see so many people start to wear that lanyard, uh, of course, members of the community, but also uh, people in high places uh, who uh, would have a say over your career. That was incredibly uh, meaningful for me, and it sent me that signal but that, you know what, this is probably a place where I'm going to be okay. And then the final episode I think of is, is the one I already talked about. Um, to go from that point of being essentially tied into a chair with your pulse monitored uh, and to confess uh, what at the time was uh, my deepest, darkest secret uh, to being at the State Department podium and speaking about the, the concern, not of me personally, and not only of me personally, but of the United States of America uh, for two gay Chechens. Uh, you know, that is something that uh, I think speaks not only to uh, my journey in government, but also I think in some ways the, the journey the country has been over over the past 10 years. You know, I think my professional coming out story is very different than, than others. You know, I grew up in campaigns, in politics, and I think back to my first campaign, which was in 2007, 2008, uh, for, her, for Hillary Clinton. And one thing that always stands out to me is at the time, uh, three, two other friends and I shared a room, as many people do when you're bunking up in campaigns, trying to find a place to sleep. Later on in life, we have all come out. We are in long-term relationships uh, with women. I mean, we're three women, gay. That is something that throughout the year we lived together was never mentioned. Although we worked for a candidate like Hillary Clinton who's always been a tremendous ally and advocate for our rights. After the 2012 President Obama re-election campaign, at that point I was already in a serious relationship with my now wife. I'll never forget, through exit interviews, organizer after organizer after organizer would say to me, you know, I've never told anybody this, but I'm gay. I think on my next campaign, I will be out. I say all of this to dialogue that although we have all been a part of very progressive, supportive, understanding campaigns, it is still something really frightening to go through. And I think for me, I was very lucky and fortunate that I never had to have a moment where I was, I am gay, I am out, or this is who I am. I just one day I just started introducing my girlfriend or my wife and people didn't flinch because of the environment that we're in. But one common tie-in for everyone that was sharing this very personal information with me and saying, you know, you make it look easy and maybe it is possible for the rest of us, is that they're all immigrant kids like myself. Right? So there was a common tie-in of who was in the closet versus who was not, even in our political space. The good news is that as many years have passed, that tends to be less and less and less the case. But I think that that's why, again, these panels, us in these roles, uh, you know, net at the podium, that is so important because people really begin to see themselves. Um, and you, and, and ultimately the goal is, of course, for these coming out stories to feel less significant, I think, and more, uh, you know, just the next step um, in somebody living out their full life. I always thought I was like coming out. Oh, please. <laughs> it always seemed that I was coming out every day. Um, and, you know, I can go back 20 plus years ago when I, you know, when, when you're trans, when you come out, you're out. I mean, there's no hiding. <laughs> it's, it's pretty obvious when, um, well, I mean, okay, so let's talk about when at Raytheon, I gave everyone about a week's notice. Um, I had the backing of the president of the company and most of the VPs, but when the announcement was made, there were people who just would shun me. And certainly the first day when I presented as Amanda, you know, it was a very, very, very lonely day. And I was a senior manager, and, you know, and it got covered by the press in Tucson, Arizona, because it's a small town. When you have a senior manager at your largest employer transition, it was a big deal. And we had, as I was also the head of the flight test organization, 
There were people, and this was a quote, concerned that I would pilot an aircraft full of employees into the side of a mountain. That kind of hurts. But you have to move on, and you have to keep, keep progressing. And when I ran for office in 04, it made national news. You know, I was the first openly transgender person to win a primary election, a contested primary in the US. And a comedian uh, who, uh, um, okay, Dennis Miller, um, referred to me on his show, not by name, but talked about there's even a trans person running in Arizona. You know, ha, ha, ha. You know, but you move on. When I got the appointment in, well, I mean, they announced it on like New Year's Day on, in 09 or in, in 10. Um, the White House was like, no big deal. No one will care. You're a minor appointee. You're not a Senate confirmed. You're a technical advisor. There's lots and lots of those. But somehow the LA Times picked up on it and it became a national event. And for the next four nights, every one of the, uh, well, either was profiled on the national news, on different networks, or on every one of the late night shows, there were jokes or skits about me. By name, showed my picture, talked about where I worked and my history. And to watch David Letterman laugh about you for 37 seconds on national TV is tough. But you have to then just move forward and be yourself, be the best you can be. Be better than your best because you have to prove to everyone that you not just deserve to be in the position you are, but that the organization is honored to have you in that position to do your job. And, you know, whether it's, you know, years later, uh, now at a, you know, a huge international company at a, an executive level, always concerned whether, do people know my history? Do I need to tell them my history? Do I come out? Do I introduce myself? I don't lead with it, never have to. I'm assuming that people know, but there's always that worry in the back of my mind if this person doesn't know and, the, and they find out, will that impact our relationship? Because, quite frankly, particularly in a European-based company like Airbus, everything is based on relationships. So coming out is not a one-time or two-time or three. It's a constant, constant concern, always in the back of our head, as much as it's been socialized and accepted and maybe even more normalized in today's society than it was 25 years ago, it still becomes that stigma that we carry with us. Um, you've all served in government over this incredible period of transformation in terms of how LGBT people are treated by the federal government in terms of the benefits and the protections that they have. Are we at a point now where those protections are solid or could, you know, if there's a change in administration, could they be revoked? Can we maybe get in, into the specifics of that? What kind of protections federal employees, L LGBT employees have and the extent to which they might be at risk? Is anyone going to tweet during this? I mean, I, I, are we off the record? I should have asked that at the beginning of this. I think... <laughs> no, I, I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, for someone who, you know, worked so hard, and I'm going to go first this time, I hope you all no know, right? but worked so hard during my years in the Pentagon to get the ban on transgender service removed to a year later, and I was on a trip for the State Department in Kazakhstan when then President Trump tweets his, you know, we will not allow any transgender uh, service members. I mean, and it's, that's devastating. And as much as we think, oh, well, we've turned the page back again, you know, and, and Lord knows if t Twitter's even gonna survive to the end of the year, but, <laughs> but it's still very, very fragile. Rafi, did you want to? Yeah, uh, having in particular worked um, in the presidential personnel office during the Obama administration um, and working closely with colleagues at um, OPM, 
it, it is still tentative and let's just you know be honest while it's fantastic that we um you know had uh the the legislation that passed uh the senate and is going to be signed and and that, that is fantastic we still don't have codified protections at the federal level and um i know that there are folks out there that are pushing very hard for that um, but it is a little bit of, um, uh, of, of a volleyball sort of um, tournament in that sense, because one administration comes in, the ball's on one side, another comes in, and the ball's on the other. And I think for, um, in particular, what spoke to me was the fact of knowing career uh, that um, during the last administration felt that they needed to actually hide a little bit or hide work that they were um, doing that was um, progressing uh, issues um, only for the LGBTQ community, many other uh, uh, communities and issues uh, that, they, that matter. Um, and so I think it, while I, I think the difference is there's now familiarity, there's now experience working on, with LGBTQ folks and also on the benefits and all, all those issues. I think about the healthcare, especially that um, we're afforded um, with uh, you know, transition related care, et cetera, that I think it's gonna be harder to force that back into the closet. And may I say, I think there will be a lot of defiant people, myself included, uh, political appointees, um, career folks, um, that I think will say, is this really the right thing to do? Is this really the best usage of payer money? Um, it, or is this the values of the United States in the 21st century? Um, yep, trade. Um, I, I think that, that that experience is in some ways is our protection, um, but it doesn't negate the fact that we do need codified protection and we need guarantees at the end of the day because um, it, we, we've, we saw what happened uh, during the last administration and frankly how close a lot of things came tumbling down. Some things certainly did, but most of it withheld. Um, but I think we can all agree, we don't want to go through that psychology every four to eight years. It's just not worth it. I'll add just, just one corollary point to, to Rafi's. Um, we started this panel talking about the imperative of uh, a public service workforce that's representative of the country. Uh, and of course, we've made strides with, with this administration, we've made strides in, in previous administrations, uh, but this is work that is far, far, far from finished. Um, and as someone who has spent most of my time in government as a career employee, I can say uh, uh, from fir firsthand experience, administrations come and go. Uh, the, the, the bulk of uh, the public service workforce are career employees uh, who outlast any single presidential administration. And the thing about a, a new administration, uh, they won't have say, they won't have sway when it comes to private sector hiring practices, not directly at least, but they will when it comes to uh, the federal government. Uh, and they will have tremendous say and sway over uh, those protections, over those incentives, over that workplace culture uh, that is just as important as I think anything else to not only uh, attracting but also retaining uh, a workforce that is diverse in all of its forms. Uh, so if we are not to be afforded uh, those protections, my concern is that the progress that the, the, the executive branch has made, uh, separate and apart from this being the most diverse administration in history, once this administration is gone, uh, I'm concerned that the career workforce um, will uh, not be as attractive a workplace uh, for many of the people who are uh, reflected in this room. I mean, I don't have much to add, but the work is far from finished. I mean, to echo what they both said, I think we have learned a lot of really hard lessons over the last two years. I mean, if you look at what happened with Dobbs and the Supreme Court around reproductive rights, it do not just impact um, what we have known traditionally is impacted under Roe, but we have seen many more consequences on that. Um, I would just stress that it's not just the president, right? There is the political appointees, 
there's the career appointees, and then there's Congress, and then there's the states. And there is a lot of movement. I think we have all been on a crash course on you know, government and politics ever since Donald Trump was elected on what rights could quickly, quickly, quickly dissolve. And so I think it's just really important to be clear-eyed, although we've made a lot of progress, although, although we've increased representation significantly and we have a president that is not just a supporter but a champion for our rights, we still have a very long way to go. Um, one of the things that sort of impacted me when I was writing my book was all these people who wanted to serve their country even when it didn't want them. Not only didn't want them, but was investigating them and purging them and ruining their lives. And I'm just curious if at any stage in your careers, did you ever stop and think, you know, this is just too much, or why am I doing this? This, you know, this, this country doesn't want me, it doesn't want my service. Did that, did that ever make you pause or... Um, Maybe if you could maybe just re reflect on, on, on that. I think this would probably be a more, a, a question more for the transgender panelists here, because I think that in recent memory, that's been a much tougher battle to fight than, than for the gays and lesbians. Andrew, you want to go first? So when I, um, prior, well, prior to, to getting into federal service, um, I had a very high security level. Uh, for the work that I did, uh, be up beyond top secret. And when I transitioned, I came up for my annual five-year refresher. <laughs> and, I, you know, you go into the small room, there's the, the interviewer, they've got the file, they've got the questions. And I remember her opening a manila folder and pulling out all these different press clippings about me and, and said, so do we need to talk about this? Your being transgender puts you at risk for someone using that to blackmail you to get secrets that would you know, jeopardize the security of this country. And I looked at her and I said, so you're saying that I'm at risk for someone blackmailing me because everything is public right there in all the press clippings <laughs> that you have spread across the table. And she folded all those clippings up, put them back in the manila folder, went back into the briefcase, and pretty much that was the end of the interview. Um, it, it, it was more of a sitting there kind of laughing at the practice of going through this when I am, in a, and I'm not in public service, I'm in practice or private service, but I'm serving the benefit, the welfare of our country by developing technology that protects us all. And you're questioning my resolve. And, and it, was, it was more befuddling and humorous than insulting. But I, I wasn't going to stop doing what I needed and felt compelled to do. Like Amanda, I certainly faced um, a lot of attention um, back in 2015 when I uh, was appointed. I was the first openly uh, transgender uh, person at, at the White House staff, um, and uh, it was a lot of notoriety. Um, but uh, what was very important to me was that people met Rafi, not the transgender woman, not just um, a person of color, not just a Honduran adoptee, they met Rafi and why Rafi was here to work. And that's something that I believe um, is very important for all appointees. While you know our identities and where we come from are, are very important, we should tenaciously hold on to them. It's also important that we know just who you are, what are the skill sets that you bring to the table. But in terms of your question about knowing that even all of that is sometimes rejected just because who we are, who we love, how we move about a room might be different than someone else if we have a disability, et cetera. Um, 
is, is very painful. And I think the thing that um, it's less about me that I think about so many people that are at risk, maybe not here just in Washington, D.C. You know, in my job, we're around the country. We're doing all this great work on infrastructure um, in places, frankly, where it is very dangerous to be LGBTQ out in rural uh, Wyoming, for example. But it is very important that we are servicing that part of the country. And I always just think about where are our people out there? And, it, and like Ned was saying, using the platform that we have to say we're here and we care and we are actually pushing that when it comes to talking about equity, um, when, when um, in putting together um, projects that, we, that we're asking uh, uh, recipients of the, the money, which is mostly the states, that they really need to prioritize um, non-traditional stakeholders all of that being said, we all know at the back of our mind there are there are the haters. Unfortunately, you know, look, I'm Jewish, and 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 anti-Semitism we say is the, one of the longest hatreds, and um, you know, it is something that we have to navigate. It's something we have to fight against. It's it's how I feel about anti-LGBTQness as well. Um, but I I do think it is very important that we have again, kind of just to. Um, put a, a fine thread on this is, is the fact that we have out people to say to people that are deep in the closet or who are very bravely out in places like rural Alabama and are fighting for, our, for their community rights that we are with you, we see you. Um, and I think it's actually even more important to say your country wants you. Your country needs your service um, because frankly, it is a generational thing that we're gonna have to pass on. At some point, we're all gonna retire. We're gonna need to pass that baton to the next generation. And I want them to be coming from these communities. We're gonna be better informed as a government from people that come from these communities, not just um, the you know, sort of coastal elite that I think people think the LGBTQ community is. We're not, we are everywhere. Yeah. Thank you. This is for the whole panel, but what advice do you have for people out in the country, in parts of the country where it's not, you know, Washington DC or New York or Los Angeles, and maybe they're deciding to run for sheriff uh, or Congress uh, or school board, and they're not out publicly, maybe they are with their families or their friends, but not professionally. Um, places where it could actually be a liability it could hurt their electoral chances. It might even hurt their chances of um, getting hired or getting appointed. What sort of advice do you have to people in those situations? Maybe Ned, you can start. Um, I'd, I'd be loath to you know, offer generalized uh, advice on something like this. I think it, it's gonna be dependent on each individual and everyone has his or her own journey. I, I, I experience mine. Uh, I think one thing that connects this community is that we each have those journey stories. Uh, and no matter who we are, no matter where we are, um, it's, it's learning about those stories that I think um, is one of the most valuable and rewarding um, elements and in, in one of the common bonds uh, of this community. So I think people are going to have to make their own decisions. But what I can say is a broad generalization. Um, as someone who has spent almost my uh, entire career to date in public service, there is nothing more rewarding. Uh, and there is nothing more rewarding to be able to serve your country uh, while also being true to yourself. Uh, and if you can find a way to combine those things, and I say if, because there may be cases where it's, it's not advisable, unfortunately. I wish we lived in a country where uh, it were uni universally advisable, but if you are able to find a way to combine those things, uh, there's, there's nothing more rewarding than that. There is no greater uh, feeling than that. And speaking from personal experience, uh, you know, I, I started uh, as a public service, uh, public servant, as someone who was not out, someone who was uh, in the closet, um, and now um, over the course of the past 15, uh, nearly 20 years, um, someone who, who is out, having gone through that, that journey uh, myself. I think people can tiptoe into public service 
and they can determine themselves over the course of that public service career what's right for them, where they are on that journey, where the country is, where, where they are uh, in terms of uh, their state, their community, their society. Uh, and unfortunately, um, that's going to, uh, that's going to um, you know, I, I think the story there is, is to be unwritten, uh, how, uh, how that evolves in the coming years. I agree. I mean, I think, you know, it's hard to prescribe a, s a swath of advice, right? You meet one candidate, you meet one candidate, you meet one community, you meet one community. Everyone is so different. Um, what I would say is for people that are thinking about running, it's very important to weigh all the opportunities as well as all the challenges that somebody could face, right? It is, of course, you know, having to dig deep to your most personal um, qualities, priorities, people that you love, things that you care about, things that you hold dear, and knowing that all of that could be exposed and knowing that um, that could be coerced into um, a really horrible message or used against you, right? However, I would also lean into all the incredible things that come with being a public servant, with running for office, with putting forth a vision that is focused on the priorities of delivering X for whatever office, for whatever people. And I do tend to believe, I'm an optimist, I do tend to believe that voters most care about people who are gonna deliver for them. I know that that has not always panned out over the last few years or maybe ever in our history. But more times than not, voters can see beyond um, some of these you know, what could be perceived in li as liabilities in these communities. I think there are a lot of examples of that. I keep coming back to Mayor Pete in South Bend, and I know South Bend is very different than the rest of Indiana, but there are these examples across the country. Um, but more than anything, I think that this is something that a potential candidate really has to reflect on, on whether or not they're up for that challenge and whether or not they're up for all of the incredible things and all of the challenging things that could come with running for office and then being elected to office. Now, I wish I could say that the most important thing about politics is being authentic to who you are, but I, I don't believe that <laughs> because I think it turns out if you want to get elected, it's being what the people want you to be. And that's not always the message that we'd like to be able to push forward. And it, particularly what we've seen over the last month, months, year, uh, has been troubling because I think there are people who are pushing agendas that is not even authentic to them, but they're doing it because of the political um, capital that they believe it would bring to them. Uh, as I was speaking earlier about some of the, the issues against LGBTQ, particularly trans kids uh, in states across the country, that's being done for political gain. It's not being done to save the kids. So. It's, you know, what advice? It's really evaluate who you are and what you stand for. And if you want to get into politics and want to be non-authentic, well, what does that say about you? I would say this is more, um, I, I think about my mother in this moment, honestly, um, who's, a, who's a big force in my life. Um, but she would say, in particular, make sure you have a good support system. Um, I think, especially as uh, appointed official, elected officials, people in public service, I think a lot of times we all know uh, that we literally are going to be in front of a camera. That you know, we have to have, uh, you know, um, a little bit of a persona uh, uh, there. Um, but it is so important to take care of yourself. Um, and I would say that in a community sense, um, remember who we are. Um, we are still vulnerable, and um, our experience of being LGBTQ um, makes us, you know, different in, in a sense that, you know, we know the microaggressions that are out there. We know that we carry a lot of community stories on our shoulders um, by our representation in a legislature or um, in the White House. Um, but it is important to take care of oneself. And I think in particular, thinking about people in parts of the country where being out and running um, as an out um, candidate, um, that a support network is, is so important. Um, I, I, I think for myself, um, you know, just uh, I, I'm constantly in touch with people that are there to make sure, like, Rafi, are you okay? It's great that you're doing all this work stuff, but literally, 
have you eaten? Have you and Sean, go, my boyfriend, gone out for a walk and done something that is non-political related? Um, because that's going to be important. Um, we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Because I'm the first one to say, if I am burnt out, um, I am of no literal public service uh, to the country. And so it's important we do take care and have great support systems. Well, this is the part of the panel uh, when we open it up for questions. I'm told that there are microphones, or do I pick? I'm not entirely sure. I see, I see hands being raised. Yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Isaac Evans France, and I'm the chair of the Vermont Democratic Party LGBT Caucus, and ran for US Senate this summer in the Democratic primary. I'm interested in the work of yours, Mr. Price. I've followed it for a while. I, been doing a lot of work to end U.S. participation in the unconstitutional participation in the war in Yemen that Saudi Arabia has been waging. And um, I'm curious about what it's like for you and your role as, as a fellow gay man to be essentially having to defend a relationship with the Saudi dictatorship that's been persecuting members of our community. You know, and they're, part of the law is that there's the penalty of death, flogging, for members of our community, and how that is for you, and how you how you do that at the same and, and a dictatorship that's waging war and starving children in Yemen um, and violating women's rights, how do you justify being a spokesperson for um, a country that maintains a relationship with that dictatorship? Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the question. It's a it's it's a good one. Um, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, and this, this is not uh, a dynamic, unfortunately, that is unique to Saudi Arabia, um, but we have two choices. Uh, we can try to engage with Saudi Arabia. We can try to have a re recalibrated relationship, a relationship that reflects our interests and our values, or we can say, as there's a, a push to do, to hell with them. Uh, we're done with them. We're uh, never going to engage with them. Uh, we're going to sever our relationship. If we want to have influence on what Saudi Arabia is, what Saudi Arabia does, if we want to have influence on any country that is not reflective of not only America's values, but values that should be universal, it doesn't do us any good to say to hell with them. It doesn't do us any good uh, to cut them off entirely. Um, if we are going to shape the trajectory of a country like Saudi Arabia or a, a broader region, there has to be some sort of engagement. Uh, and now that engagement can't be the type of engagement that we had in the last administration, I don't think, where uh, blank checks were, were offered. It was uh, just a, a total um, bear hug uh, to a, a country like Saudi Arabia. Um, but there is a middle ground there where we can engage practically we can pursue our shared interests. There are 70,000 Americans in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, obviously, we need to care about their safety and, and well-being. But uh, when we do have that engagement and uh, some semblance of a bilateral relationship, we can push the kingdom, try to push the kingdom and its decision makers uh, in a more constructive route when it comes to human rights, uh, when it comes to specifically LGBTQ plus rights, women's rights, the rights of minorities. The Saudis aren't going to listen to a thing we say uh, if we tell them that we're done and we're moving on. Uh, okay, let's, this is not about Saudi Arabia today. <laughs> Are there other questions? Y yeah. Who's that? Yes, yes, behind there. I'm being blinded, yes, go ahead. Yes, um, good afternoon to the panelists and the audience. Um, Washington Bramble from Antigua. I started working for the government when I was 19 years old in 1999 as a, te a teacher. And uh, when I started, shortly after, I began to identify as a trans woman. And I was almost fired on several occasions for transitioning. Remember, you know, I come from a third world country, not the great United States. And 
through my journey transitioning into a trans woman, um, it sort of brought out the advocacy in me because basically there was no one to help me with my fight. I had to find the hero within myself. Um, based on that struggle, um, I became a director of an Eastern Caribbean um, organization, EK, the Eastern Caribbean Alliance for Diversity and Equality. And, and now I'm the executive director of OGDEEC, Organization for Gender Diversity and Equality. Um, I've heard the struggle that each of you have gone through, but can you imagine being in a third world developing nation? I mean, when I started to transition, people didn't even know what, what being trans was. They thought it was just that, you know, being trans is like being a gay guy who went too far. Nobody understood it. But I have come to a point where now the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda has sponsored me being in this forum. He's very, you know, pro-LGBT. His name is the Honorable Gaston Brown. Um, he's willing, he's willing to, you know, um, give trans people their rights to identify as the gender of um, their choice. I still face a lot of obstacles, but 20 years ago, 23 years ago when I started, I could not dress according to the gender of my choice in my job. Today, I am able to do that. So a lot of us believe that um, these struggles, we will win them overnight. Some, it took me 23 years. I started working when I was 19, and it took me 23 years for me to finally, finally get some sort of peace in my workplace. And recently, um, an organization that I was a part of, ECAID, um, took, them, took a matter to the court where, according to Antiguan law, same-sex relationships, um, any sort of relationship that did not occur between a biological male and a female were illegal. Recently, we took the matter to the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and a victory was won and the, the law was repealed. And the prime minister basically said that he would not appeal any further. So um, basically, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a long fight. Anybody who faces this sort of discrimination, you can't win overnight. And um, it takes a lot of, you know, tenacity. And, and you know, you have to stick with it. Thank you. Is there, is there okay. a question for the panelists? Basically, I was just, I was just sharing, sharing my experience <laughs> as you. a you know, trans person in a third world, third, third world um, developing nation. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. thanks. Uh, I think we have time for one more. Yes. Hi, my name is Bree Fram. I'm here representing the Department of the Air Force's LGBTQ initiatives team, one of the department's seven barrier analysis working groups. So earlier this year, the administration put out an executive order calling for increased SOGI data gathering within the federal government. How do you see that being implemented in a way that helps us knock down barriers for those in federal service? And what are kind of some of the next frontiers in that? The one I'm particularly thinking of is how do we better incorporate our non-binary siblings uh, into the government? But if there are any other things you think that data can be used for, I'd love to hear about what that might be. Thank you. Whoever wants to. Um, I can say at the agency level, um, and it's great to see you, Bree, um, that uh, work is being done. Uh, that actually there uh, are a lot of uh, interagency uh, council work that has kicked off. It has frankly started a conversation at our agency about, well, what data do we collect? Um, and if we're not collecting it, or if we're not incentivizing, in, in our instances, the different um, modal administrations and, and their counterparts at the state, so, you know, the MTAs, the MBTAs, uh, the port authorities, et cetera, um, let's find out. I think 
where it's a little bit challenging, Bri, as you say, is that um, this, is, uh, this is a new frontier for a lot of government writ large, let alone, I'm just gonna say for us in the transportation space, where um, we're not human services, right? You know, if we are intaking, it's, pr it's a pretty basic level. Um, I think some of us have experienced in the last few weeks um, uh, that the local metro here is uh, doing surveys and I've noticed that they've had some um, uh, SOGI-like questions, but probably we would all say here we could do it a little bit better. Um, I think we're just starting that conversation. What's so exciting, though, is that remembering where um, a few years ago where we were really behind of whether this was even going to happen. I remember in the final years of the Obama administration, we were hoping to get the kind of push that we have gotten from the White House, from the president, ultimately, to say this data matters. So um, I, I think it is something that we are very much committed to. Um, I personally am, and, and part of that work stream. Um, but, you know, I think we, we do need the time as that government does to get it right, but we also need all of you to be pressuring us and to make sure that we're doing it correctly. Uh, well, thank you so much. Can we ha have a round of applause for this incredible panel? Um, thank you all. Uh, I think I'm gonna be signing my book outside, so that's my plug for my book. And, um, Thanks so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you to our phenomenal panel and moderator. Keep an eye out for James' book signing this afternoon. This concludes Victory Institute's closing plenary. Please welcome Victory Institute President and CEO, Mayor Anise Parker, to the stage for her closing remarks. Okay, this will be quick and easy. And, and that is that we've had an amazing few days. Again, thanks to the Marriott staff for taking great care of us. Thanks to the Victory staff for all the hard work putting together a kick-ass conference. Thanks to you for being with us. Some of you who traveled a very long distance to be here, we truly appreciate it. Give yourselves a hand. Uh, and if you're, as you're heading out, if you see our conference team of Pooja or Leilani, please give them, give them a hug. They're gonna be really tired tonight. I uh, hope you're leaving with valuable skills and information, but most importantly, if you're not leaving here with, without a new friend, without a new contact, without somebody that you can call or text when you're having a problem back at home uh, about whatever your particular issue is in your legislative uh, or executive body, you really have failed the task. I'm just telling you. This is about connecting with each other. Make sure you, I don't want to take those totes back to the office, make sure you grab a tote. Make sure you take a picture in front of that step and repeat out there and tweet, 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 or Facebook or whatever. I guess we're, maybe we're not tweeting right now. And then join us at 4 p.m. in the Penn Avenue Terrace for the closing party. And I know it will be a great one. Thank you for a great conference. <laughs> <laughs>